Hey everyone, Steve Richard here. Welcome to Call Camp. And what the heck are you doing watching a webinar? You're supposed to be closing business. I'm just joking around. Uh, this is actually a perfect lesson today for closing business. Uh, I've got Mike Dennis here with me sitting in the room. Mike, say hi to everybody. Hey everybody. Uh, and the lesson that, that he shared with me prior on closing, I just think is so incredibly relevant. And, and, uh, and timely for, for where we are right now in December. This is something if you're watching On Demand later on, you might be going, well, now it's February, Steve. It's still incredibly relevant. And the process of closing calls is something that I don't see a whole lot of salespeople doing a good job of, and it's so simple. So uh, Mike, introduce yourself real quick and give, give your backstory. Yeah, so thanks everybody for joining. Long time listener, first time hoster. Thanks for having me, Steve. I spent the first 10 years of my career at Hanover Research here in DC. And Steve, you know Hanover's founder well. He pushed us very hard to scale quickly, and that was done with a 100% outbound selling effort, brute force method, if you will. And so that meant our strategy and sales process had to be extremely effective to hit really aggressive growth targets. And closing the call was a really small piece of that overall process, uh, but a really simple framework that I know can make a really big difference for both reps and managers. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and, and it's that, that process, the key word being process, process is a, a series of steps or activities that you can do repeatedly over and over and over again in a rinse and repeat and scalable way. Having that process in place is what makes all the difference in the world. So, um, and actually, hang on, I just want to make sure that there are no technical challenges. Everything's okay. I have a hand up here. Someone's hands raised. Uh, if you have anyone, if you have any trouble, if you're having any difficulty hearing, please uh, just put a chat in and we'll, we'll get that resolved. So, Mike, let, let's talk about. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about closing, and in December, we're talking about closing the deal. Everyone's talking about closing the deal, getting in your revenue now, and what you're really talking about is closing the call. What, what's the difference? Yeah, so I think that's an important distinction, uh, and so let's, let's start by talking about what this is not. This is not a clinic on transactional selling techniques. We are not talking about ways to get signed paperwork back. Really, what we're talking about is the last five minutes of any sales meeting, and what we're going to learn today is a simple framework for closing your calls. And so what does that mean exactly? What does closing your call mean? Really, it's a series of ordered questions to help you understand the buyer's internal process. So how do we align this sales opportunity with reality? And so within that framework, I'm going to give you key questions, key scripting. Uh, but to make a fine point of this, this is not a script for you to follow. Uh, that script depends on how your call goes. And so managers out there who are trying to implement this, just know that it's really challenging to implement a specific script. Much easier to follow a simple framework and have your reps do that scripting on their own. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, anytime you're going to implement a, a selling technique, a, a, a piece of the sales process, you always have to stop and ask, why are we doing this in the first place? Why bother? You know, why are we focusing on this? Why aren't we focusing on something else? So if you talk about closing the call, why bother doing this at all, Mike? Yeah, so for account execs, I think it's one of the easiest changes you can make to improve outcomes across your entire business. We're going to talk about that in a second here. The other thing is it's, it's not complicated. I promise this will help you work smarter and eliminate meaningless activity from your entire business. And for managers, not only does it touch all aspects of your rep's business, because at the end of the day, it's about helping them invest their time in the right opportunities, but it's also really easy to coach. And beyond that, it helps you hear and learn the feedback of messages that are resonating from customers within the market and to quickly identify other challenges or weaknesses that your reps are having. Yeah, and, and I think that's a key thing too, is that people like it. But like, before we get into like, you know, what's in it for the buyer? Anytime we talk about any of these methods, it's always like, what's in it for the buyer? Let's open a poll up here because, uh, you know, the, the, this picture just, it, it's, I, I have a love-hate relationship with this picture. And uh, you, you hear people in, in the sales profession, you know, talk about this one way or another. What's your association with the word closing? You know, it, so what we're looking for here in an answer is if you hear the word closing, do you have a, does it have a positive, does it have a negative connotation? Now, we might be loading the responses here for the, participants Mike because this time of year when I hear the word closing really the only thing that matters to me other than my family right now and, and, and my religion is 
signed SAS agreements. That's about all I care about. So you might see some people coming through positive. But in general, if I think about the word closing, it tends to have a negative connotation for me. But yeah, everyone, go ahead and vote. We got 57%. Keep on voting here. Keep on voting. When you hear the word closing, does that have a positive connotation that has a negative connotation? What's your association with the word closing? All right. And I will close the poll. And I believe if I didn't screw this up, can you still see my screen, Jesse? We good? Yeah. All right. We're still on. Beautiful. So it turns out, hey, look at that. A bunch of salespeople. 74% <laughs> of people have a positive connotation, a little bit not what we expected, right? And 26 people negative connotation, but you know, kind of build off that with that you know, negative perception that's, that's out there. Just speak to that. Yeah, so I was really interested to see the results of this poll. In my experience, and especially in talking to less experienced reps or more junior folks on the team, uh, oftentimes we're met with the defensive mindset when it comes to any training, any coaching associated with closing. I think reps often think, you know, man, I can't do this if I haven't made enough progress. I'm going to make my prospects mad if I ask them questions that are too forward. And so what I want to do first is really sell those non-believers on the importance of closing by letting them know how it's going to help their, their process and their prospect. Um, you know, uh, Steve, we were talking before here, and uh, I'd mentioned that uh, a rep that we had worked with wanted to change, always be closing, to always be helping. I think that's exactly right. As salespeople, we really want to be helping our prospects through the process. I don't know if that's going to catch on with the kids. So uh, why don't we stick with always be closing and let's try and change the perception, any of the negative perceptions that are still out there around this. I love it. ABH just doesn't have that same ring, does it? Uh, I, you know, we're hearing a lot about account-based marketing, ABM, that's got a nice crisp ring, but ABH now, it's, it's really going to be always be closing. So let me jump into call number one. Uh, give us, while I'm making this transition here, Mike, I stopped my screen, everyone. So just so you're aware, you're not going to be seeing anything on your screen right now um, because these are real calls. There's some sensitive information associated with these calls that we don't want to have broadcast on the webinar. So we're going to start off with a, a salesperson named Miles. And just tell the backstory here on this call, Mike, and then we'll get to the we'll get to the listening. Yeah, so I think this call is really interesting because my guess is that it's representative of the vast majority of calls, especially with less tenured reps. Those calls end with no discernible process. And because there's no process, we're not getting the information we ultimately need to create the most effective strategy for moving that opportunity forward. Now, let's also, you know, one of, the, one of the core tenets of call camp is positive, productive. You know, we try to make this as, as positive and productive as we possibly can. The thing that we heard collectively in this call in advance is he did a really good job of opening the call with an agenda. He did a really good job of discovery. He did a really good job of aligning the, the solution, in this case, Hanover Research, to the, the need and the, and the issue that, that this particular buyer faced. So it's it's interesting that now we're, you can't see this on your screen, but we're 28 minutes into this call, the 31 minute call. But really, if you think about it, probably the most important of the part of the call is this last three minutes. And this is the area where Miles can improve, right? Yeah, and you can also tell too, his prospect is engaged. He's done a good job getting through this conversation and eliciting this interest. He gets the call scheduled, but listen, listen to some of the uh, the gaps in, in the process here. Let's do it. And I gotta, I'll fiddle around with the volume so it's a fine line between hearing it and making it too loud. Need to oftentimes folks don't. Um, yeah. So it's either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, good, good. And I think, um, you know, you, you've given me, I think, uh, you know, an idea of what the, the cost aspect is, how many deliverables you could expect per year, per year on average. And then I think if, you know, if there's maybe what I would look is if there's something that you think fits more what you and I talked about that you could send my way, then I feel like I can now have a substantive conversa conversation with my boss and say, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah. And then you and I could have some follow-up after that. And that's, I talk to them typically every Monday um, okay. during our, our meeting. So to give you an idea in terms of where I would be. So. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So yeah, what I can do is the three things that I sent you are pretty, they're pretty, they're good, really good, interesting studies based on methodology. Yeah. But let me go ahead and dig in um, and see if there's anything that I can find on market entry. 
specifically in, you know, more B2B and hopefully plastics, but anything kind of materials. No, I, I think anything, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be plastics. Anything that would be market entry, I would be interested in seeing. Okay. Or maybe you guys looked at region or you looked at a segment that ate your full pounds. Because that, I think, would be, again, and, and um, that, that would be what I think would be of most value to us. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that makes yeah that makes a ton of sense to me. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll dig around for some more some more of that type of work. But um yeah, if you'd be willing to go ahead and maybe set aside a few minutes, maybe um next week this this time next week to just follow up yeah. see, see how your conversation went Monday, and I'll go ahead and invite um invite Jay to that conversation, who's uh, the first the, the person I'm speaking about, who can talk okay. through you know the reports in a little bit more detail and kind of help us scope anything out, and then. Uh, if there's anybody you want to bring, or if it's just you, we can have that conversation. Then, if um, next Wednesday works, let me make sure. Let me make sure. Let me check out yeah. my calendar. Real and again, I'm, I'm on my email pretty regularly. So if you file, um, if you file, you know, if you send me some notes. Uh, and I, I I hear this, Mike, as I'm listening to this, and I've listened to literally thousands of calls that sound like this. This ending of a call is such a classic case. I, right. I, you see this pattern again and again and again. The uh, You're talking to a single prospect. Uh, I know you know we're going to spend a little time on Challenger. I actually uh, I strongly recommend people read the Challenger customer. It's about five times better than the Challenger sale. Um, and, and you think about all the different decision makers that are out there and how hard it is to build consensus in a business. So you've got a salesperson talking to a buyer who's a single person who now has a shared vision of how a solution can meet a need, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got a shared vision of how a solution can meet a need, and he has to go and bounce the idea off his boss. At this point, the buyer really doesn't know what the best things are to do. They almost need to be coached on how to buy and how to navigate all the different decision makers and mobilize the team and all that kind of stuff. And the salesperson, Miles, did, you know, to his credit, he's scheduling a meeting, so he's doing that part of it. He's kind of under Understanding you're talking to your boss, you're scheduling a meeting, but then to the trained ear like yours, you're hearing Swiss cheese. So what, talk to us about the feedback for him. Right, yeah. So as I mentioned, it sounds like our, our contact here is engaged. He's talking about having a conversation with his boss on Monday. And immediately, I think that's what Miles latches onto. Because he's talking to his boss on Monday, all of a sudden, we assume that he's going to have positive things to say. He's going to try and sell his boss on this idea or find budget for it. And so as a result of that, we volunteer then to send additional studies, invite additional stakeholders. And what's not clear to me is how is that going to help us move the process forward? What hesitations is his boss going to have? Has he ever taken a service like this or asked for an investment of this magnitude to his boss previously? So yeah, like you said, a lot of holes in, in understanding for what's exactly what's actually happening. So let's let's stop and break those down a little bit. So what is he going to say to the boss? Uh, what, right? I mean, these are the yeah. things I'd ask. What are you going to say to your boss? What, what other conversations have you had like this before with your boss? What other ideas have you brought to the table that ultimately became a reality with a company made a B2B purchase? Mm -hmm. I, I ask people, what's the last thing you bought for the company? It's a simple question to ask. What's the last thing you bought for the company? And, and the, the answer is so telling. You either hear nothing, in which case you kind of already know how much power that person has and where they stand on the power threshold. They say, uh, I, I bought this and this and this, and here's the process. Here's how it works. Beautiful. Right now we know. Or you hear people who say, well, hey, I'm new here. I don't know. I'm figuring it out. That said, they've empowered me with a budget and they brought me in here to make moves in the business. So I know I'm going to be buying things. Yeah. 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 And all really telling information. And, and as sales managers who are on the line, you know, how many of you have asked your rep, why do you think this is a good opportunity and heard something like, well, we had a really good conversation. They told me there's budget for doing this kind of work. And as we hear that, it's a, a really big leap to assume that, well, they're going to spend budget on this or that really good conversation then lends itself to having a really good opportunity. And so that's really what we want to do here by applying this framework to the end of our calls is it helps us be a better partner for our prospects by eliminating these assumptions. And closing ensures, again, that your strategy is grounded in reality and that ultimately you're on the same page as your prospects. So why bother here? Well, again, it's really about investing your time more efficiently in the right opportunities. 
And that helps you forecast more accurately, focus on the opportunities that are actually close and ultimately close more deals. Mike, you put a duplicate slide in here. Come on, man. <laughs> You're killing me. No, but I get it. The whole point is that you, you wanted to emphasize, the, you know, why, why do you bother doing this? And the, the really the, the punchline is it's good for the buyer. And this is where I get to jump on with a little color commentary because I can tell you being the, you know, we've got about 70 people in this business and we spend money in this company. And I've been on both, uh, both sides of the buying and the selling, a lot more on the selling and a lot less on the buying. But when you're in the buying side, the questions that feel uncomfortable to the salesperson to ask, like, how are you going to pay for this? You know, it, it, that just me saying that in this public webinar is, makes me a little uncomfortable. Hey, Mike, how are you going to pay for this? Right. But as a buyer, when someone asks you, how are you going to pay for this? And if you're a real buyer, you shouldn't feel squeamish. You should actually be going, that's a really good point. How am I going to pay for this? Let me think about it. What, which budget bucket would this come out of? Could I get somebody else to pay for it? Could I, could I use unused travel budget? You know, could I get a, a government grant to pay for this as the, as the way many, many times training or coaching? So there's, you know, the questions that the, the salesperson may feel uncomfortable asking are the sorts of things that actually counterintuitively, the buyers feel more comfortable because you're asking those questions. Right. They, can, they see that you've been there before and done this before and you can actually help make this a reality for them. So let's talk about your framework because it's so, so money. Yeah, exactly. So five simple steps here. It's an easy, simple framework, I promised. So what are our five steps? I don't have an acronym for this. I know you guys were all drowning in acronyms to begin with, although Steve, as I'm looking at this slide, that five looks like S and I'm realizing it spells Satan <laughs> down the side there. Um, so that doesn't quite go with our, our message here about closing, but hey, it makes it easier to remember. Um, so when you're, when you're closing calls, everyone, just remember Satan. That's, that's the last thing you thought we want you to have here at call camp. Now, but like, a, you know, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Catholic guy. We're not talking about that seriously, guys. This is all tongue in cheek. Uh, but yeah, Mike, go with the framework. What are the five steps? Yeah. So step one, five minutes. You have to budget five minutes in order to run the series of questions that you need moving forward. So that's step one. First and foremost, budget five minutes. Step two, alignment. Do we have alignment here? Really critical to get that permission from your prospect and get an indication of how are you doing? Is this going well, or they may be interested, great, let's keep going, let's get that permission. Three and four here I think are interchangeable, whether you ask about approval or timeline first or second, isn't as important, but really critical that you ask about both. Let's start with timeline here. How urgent is this? How are they thinking about this within the context of everything else they have going on? And then four, approval and evaluation. We think about this in the same right because approval is who's our decision maker where does the budget come from but steve like you said with challenger there are so many people involved in this who is going to be involved in building this consensus who's involved in evaluating the service and then step five next step schedule call if appropriate so we have to get agreement from our prospect the next step we propose is one they think is going to be productive because we need their buy -in. beautiful okay so we're going to get into some calls some examples Hey, everyone, while you're listening, call campers out there. Uh, please do chat. We've got Jesse, our marketing director over here, manning the chat. Please do ask questions. Um, I just want to make sure everybody can hear okay and everything is good. He's giving me thumbs up and thumbs downs. Everything's looking green lights now. At, start teeing up your questions. Like if, you, if a question pops to your mind or a comment, let's make this interactive, right? If a comment pops in your mind, just type it in there, and then Jesse will periodically interrupt us and say, hey, you know, uh, Susan in Tacoma, Washington has something to say. So uh, let's let's jump into the, uh, all right, let's see if I can do this. Stop sharing the screen. I got that part. All right. And we're going to, we're jumping into the five minutes, right? Oh, let, yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me here. Let's just jump into one more thing. One more thing to cover, Mike. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you wanted to talk about budgeting your time. Yeah. So when we think about this five minutes as the first step, I'll tell you, Steve, this used to be a four-step framework. And what I realized was that if we don't include this five minute budget as an explicit step within our framework, it starts to break down. All of the fears that we talked about coming from your reps, uh, asking these questions, they all come true if you try to rush through those questions. So this close these questions, it takes five minutes. And so make sure you budget your time. And Steve, some of the things that I hear from reps, well, we were having such a productive conversation. I didn't want to pull up. I didn't want to end it. 
look, you can have be having the best call you've ever had. If you don't close it, do yourself a disservice because you don't know what happens afterwards. So this is all about controlling the call, controlling the conversation. A couple of quick tips here. I like to start any of those calls with, hey, I have a scheduled for 30 minutes here. Is that right? And then say you are having a really good conversation. You want to keep it going. Just do a quick time check. Hey, so we have about five minutes left of our scheduled time together. Do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour? Maybe they give you additional time. Maybe they say, yep, I've got a call with our CEO. I've got to hop off. Great. Now you can pivot to your close. So Steve, I've got a, a call here um, that we can listen to. Here's what happens if you don't budget that time. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and, and remember, uh, this is good. I can't emphasize this enough. This is good for the buyer. A lot of people, a lot of times people hear this stuff and they think this boy, this sounds and feels very salesy, very uh, sales centric, sales driven, sales oriented. Where's the buyer and all this? And the answer is the buyer is, is actually is better for the buyer because if you're, if you're going to make this idea that was brought up a reality for the buyer, they need help. They need help navigating their own organizations and navigating the decision-making process. And so to the extent that you can help them figure out how to do that, it makes a big deal. In a review, I would have, you know, or, or else just use her title of uh, little faint. So bear with it. Lean in and turn up your, your speakers as much as you can because I'm maxed out over here. Marketing. Okay, I am updating that right now. Um, anyway, I've got a call at 11 or another meeting that I have to jump towards. So, uh, is there anything else? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to update the proposal and send it over to you. And then, um, Steve, you hear that? Mm -hmm. An immediate shift in the tone as the rep. Urgency. Urgency. <laughs> I've got to get through this. There's so much I've got to cover. Oh, crap. I've only got uh, two minutes before I need to get off. And then, and then that cascades through the remainder of our call. And it's literally two minutes. We're at 2629 of a 2829. And that's where the salesperson hears the buyer say, hey, this has been great. I got to hop off. And it's like <gasps> immediate panic, right? What is the plan for scheduling a, kind of a presentation to Tim? Well, you know, um, this is, like I said, a, a very short week. Uh, chances are we're going to get your, we are going to get yours uh, proposal as well as the other people. And initially, she will just probably forward them to her and then set up some time. Maybe it'll be next week. Okay. And you hear that answer from him? Okay. I guess maybe we're going to probably uh, get some other proposals and then maybe forward them to her and schedule some time. And basically what that answer means is I have no freaking idea how we're going to make this decision. And at this point too, he's checked out. He's thinking about his next call. He's already stated he needs to move on. So it's hard for him to engage. It's really tough when you don't have the time to do this. It just doesn't work. You want to play a little bit more? Yeah. When would be a good time to just follow up with you to, um, you know, close the loop and see about scheduling the call? Oh, that one makes me cringe a little bit. When's the best time to um, close the loop and follow up with you or follow up with you to close the loop? Try to avoid the close the loop, follow up, touch base, check in. And granted, this is happening because the salesperson's under stress right now. Right, exactly. He's under stress right now. And he normally would not say those things. Exactly. Right. We have one question from the audience that I think is perfect for right now. The question is from Seth. And what, what they're asking is, how do, you, how do you know if the prospect you're talking to is on board right now? Yeah, exactly. So we are, th that is, Seth, a really good question. That is why it's the first step in our framework and it's what we're going to cover next because it is so critical that your that you have the permission from your prospect to continue. That's our alignment question. Yep. And Let, let's go, let's jump to yeah, alignment. Let's, 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 let's jump right into it because I think the five minutes we covered that well and that was a beautiful example. So Mike, when you're talking about how do you know if, if the buyer's on board that they want to play this game and go along with the process? Who was that? That was Seth. Seth, thanks. Great question, Seth. Take it away, Mike. Yeah, so really great segue. This is the first step really in the framework, uh, apart from budgeting the time for it, because we can't move forward if we don't have permission. So it's the most critical question, the most critical step. It's also the scariest question for your reps oftentimes to ask, because they're worried about disqualifying their opportunity. 
they're worried about getting uh, feedback that might make it seem like they're being too aggressive. And so we have to ask, hey, based on our conversation today, do you see alignment with a service like ours? So, so hang on, Mike, this is a good point. What if they don't? Do you, and this is what Seth's saying, we're having a conversation with Seth over chat at the same time here. He's basically saying, hey, look, at that point, do you back up the truck if you don't have agreement and yeah. do you go back into discovery? So if they say no, I think it is telling for a few different reasons. One, it gives you good feedback on how much progress you were able to make in the scheduled time that you had together. But also, too, I would try and understand, well, why not? Is it because they don't have budget, because they have other priorities, because this isn't important to them, because they're the wrong contact? There are so many different reasons why there might not be alignment. So I always pivot to information gathering. And hey, maybe it's a product market fit issue. Maybe this is something that you can give back to your boss and you can give them really good feedback based on a specific contact you thought was going to be a really good buyer for you. But may not be for one reason and and sometimes guess what the they might have a, a need and seth you did great discovery and you uncovered a, a, a challenge that you can solve for but they don't perceive your solution as being the thing that addresses that challenge in which case you know this there's also the opportunity to walk away and we got to remember that too so let's listen to call number three any other points on alignment before we go to number three yeah so in, in Seth, this is again i think a really good question because for alignment do we have alignment with a service like ours all you're looking for is a yes or a maybe uh, if you get a yes and yes but maybe because that's great now we can continue forward we have the implicit permission to continue with the rest of our questions um, the other thing I would mention here is it does not matter how good or bad you perceive the call to be. You have to ask this question and it has to be in the form of a question. You have to get your prospect to make an assessment and verbalize their thoughts. Because oftentimes we'll hear from reps, hey, you know what, I'm 99% sure that they're going to move forward here. They told me they're sold. Great, let's get them to verbalize that. And let's use that in our scripting. Hey, you had mentioned that this is a really great solution. It solves a specific problem and you need to get started next week. Um, so it sounds like they're really good alignment here. Would you agree? Mm. And they're gonna say yes, and here's the reason. Yes, because, and they're gonna give you more information. Same thing if it was a bad call. If you're picking up really bad vibes from your prospect and uh, you're not sure that this is a good fit, let's just state that. As salespeople, we need to be reading our customers and you can, you have license to say, hey, you mentioned you might not be with the right contact or you don't have budget for this. Um, so I'm curious if as you listen to a little bit more about what we offer, do you see alignment here? And you know, some of the times you might be surprised at what people say or some of the left field answers you'll get. And that ultimately helps you to maybe sell into the account in a different way, change tactics, talk to different buyers within that account. But you never get that information if you don't have it. It's a simple, now there's another uh, uh, label for this technique, trial close. Mm -hmm. It's a simple trial close. So everyone, everyone out there listening to Call Camp, please get a pen out, write this down, type it, whatever you do. I don't care, ever note, whatever you're doing. Um, simple thing to do. Boy, based on our conversation, it sounds like there is a, a lot of alignment here, or it sounds like there's not alignment here. Would you agree? And it's, it's, a, it's just a really easy out. And the thing I love about this uh, guy named Tom Freeze teaches this in his uh, sales training called question-based selling is it gives the people the opportunity to have an out. Uh, we also see that in uh, start with no Jim camp, who's actually since the C's they talk about give people an out. So the opportunity to give people the, op the, the space to have a real answer, and have the out if there really isn't anything there is again something that the average salesperson just doesn't do. So yeah, and remember we're trying to align our opportunity with reality, and this is a really good way to do that. Beautiful. So let's go listen to a call. That's why we're here, right? Hang on. Ba, 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 ba. And keep the questions and comments coming, everyone. You're doing a great job out there today, and, and I tell you, it, it's a lot easier to, to put on the show over here, and it's frankly a lot more engaging and, and fun for you if you're involved in the action. So. Uh, let's try to make this as much of a two-way conversation as we can. We're listening to Nolan. Yep. Is that what we're doing now? Okay. So we're on Nolan. You want to give the backstory on this? Yeah. So Nolan's a great salesperson. He's somebody that we coach through this process as well. And I think this call is a, a really illustrative example of exactly this point. You need permission in order to ask the additional questions that are going to guide you through this process. Gotcha. And uh, okay, so actually on that point, and I, and I think this is where you were headed with that with that comment. You know, China, it's typically you know it's not just not a great concept. Let's let's work together. Oftentimes, 
you know, the process of evaluating handover is, you know, maybe a higher level conceptual conversation like this. But then oftentimes we'll we'll have a follow up where we'll really drill into, you know, well, you know, here are three or four or five you know, specific, um, you know, items on your plate right now. And like you said, you know, it's it's not immediate. It's not always immediately obvious exactly where this would plug in, which is oftentimes where we'll have that follow up um, to kind of talk through, you know, okay, if this was to be handed to handover, how would we manage that? What kind of methodology would we employ? What would our general approach be to, to see if that lines up with what you? Yeah. So we hear Nolan talking through what a typical evaluation process looks like. And, and that's exactly right. That's exactly what this process typically looks like. Now let's listen to what our context is. Be looking for uh, to see if that, you know, basically map strengths, right? Um, I mean, would, would you see that as, as kind of a fair next step? Yeah, I would think that, in, uh, that, that seems like it would be a next step if somebody wanted to use your, your service. Yep. Sorry, that's kind of funny. That seems like it'd be a good step for someone who wants to use your service, but not for me. That's basically what he's implying. Right. Yeah, so we don't have his implicit permission to continue. And so because of that, you'll, you'll hear he starts to get a little bit defensive. He starts to back off. And it's because he doesn't feel like he's in control of the conversation and the next steps that we're suggesting. We're loading him up with work, and he's not quite at that. Right, we've told him, hey, this is how you're gonna buy us. And he's saying, oh, oh, stop the presses. Who said I'm buying anything? And this is where asking that simple question to repeat it again, because it's so powerful is, you know, based on our conversation, it seems like we have great alignment. Would you agree? And in this case, he clearly would have said no. Yeah. So really quickly, we have a question from Emery. And what he's asking is, once you lose someone's engagement, how do you re-engage them? Lose someone's engagement at this stage in the call. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really good tell for maybe how you did in, in other parts of the conversation. So I mentioned this at the top here. As you re-listen to the last five minutes of these calls and as you're asking these series of questions, you start to get a sense for what's not resonating. So are they not engaged because they're not seeing the fit? Is it because they don't have the budget, because they're not the right person? But we have to unearth that first. So what is this business? reason that they're not engaged. Uh, maybe it's because we didn't do a very good job executing the call for the first 25 minutes. And keep in mind, we're 28 minutes through this call at this point. Yeah. Uh, and so if our contact is not engaged, that's a sign one way or another that there's something that's maybe going wrong. Yeah, I've talked about minutes. this before in previous call camps. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Call it the law of physics and the law of sales physics. Uh, so if you're not getting that you know, you're starting to, to see where you stand. Or alternatively, they might just have a personal distraction. I mean, for all you know, they might have just got a text that said that their, their daughter's in the hospital. I mean, we don't right. know. Right, exactly. And Emery, I think that's another really good point here because if you start losing as a salesperson the engagement of your prospect at this stage, what's, what's the salesperson's default? Mm -hmm. It's to go into full-on panic mode and they start <laughs> volunteering all of the work they can possibly think of to do for this prospect. And so they're sending additional follow-up materials, they're looping in other internal stakeholders, they're creating a ton of needless work for themselves for a prospect who maybe isn't even interested. That's great. And it's to try and recapture that engagement. That's great. All right, let's keep going here. Okay. So, Sean, you mentioned, you know, wanting to have the, the deck that you could you know, potentially discuss it with a few other people. Um, no, the, the purpose for that, I, I assume, would be to, to kind of feel out if anyone has any um, sort of burning research priorities um, at the moment to kind of get the reaction to this. Is that right? Well, yeah, first what I'd like to do is just kind of think about it myself. You're covering an awful lot of ground here. We have a lot of, an awful lot of initiatives here. I would have to first think through my mind um, what I think might be some potential um, um, synergies or alignment um, that would warrant the need for considering this, move forward with this. And so based on that context, then I would probably then use that for if, you know, if I found those things to be able to say, hey, here's, a, here's an option for us to be able to pursue. Mike, uh, 
I'm getting flashbacks to middle school here when I asked Carrie Swiderski to the dance, and boy, it sounded an awful lot like that. And uh, I'll tell you what, she didn't go to the dance with me. So uh, yeah, what are you hearing here? Yeah, so he, not only am I hearing that we've lost control of the conversation, but we're now dealing with a defensive prospect who says, look, this is what I'm going to do. And even later in this call, he tells us, you know what, but I'm not even going to do that for three weeks. I've got a ton of other stuff going on. So why don't you do all of the work that you just volunteered to do for me? I'll commit to looking at it at some point over the next four to six weeks here, and I'll get back in touch with you. Yikes. And so it's like saying with Carrie Swirsky saying to me, Steve, just get a little bit better looking <laughs> and a little bit smarter and have a little bit more money and then come back and ask me again. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think we can we can move on here. <laughs> um, but Emery, yeah, good, good point about the engagement of the prospects here, because I think that's a really natural reaction for, for most salespeople who want to be cognizant. All right. So now we're at number three, which is alignment. Do we have any other questions there, Jesse? We good. We're good uh, to go. Yeah, we got another question. So. Um, at this point in the call, uh, Seth always feels like they're leapfrogging the contact, trying to get them to pass them off to the next person of the line. How do you position yourself in a way that gets you on the phone with the actual DM without pissing off your contact? Seth, you're one step ahead of me here every time. <laughs> We're talking, uh, so I think that's a really good question, and that's step four in our cadence here. No, just parking lot. Yeah. Yeah, so, we're so, going to answer it. Yeah, so when I think about approval evaluation, so how do you avoid, uh, like you said, pissing off your prospect and feeling like you're jumping over their head? Well, think about all of the steps that you, you know go into this buying process, whether you start with a manager and need to go to the director, VP, C-level contact. First, you have to understand, well, what does that buying process look like internally? Who's involved with the approval or evaluation? of this service and so i think uh, approval and evaluation are related here they're not the same right because approval often deals with where does the budget come from who's the ultimate decision maker here but again going back to challenger we know five to six people are often involved in any b2b sale and so it's who are those people so uh, as we think about the evaluation process for a service like this you'd mentioned potentially wanting to include this person uh, would it make sense to include them in a follow-up conversation uh, you can ask questions like that just to make it seem a little more casual, a little more laid back, but you're still gathering really valuable information to help move it forward. Yeah, Seth, I'll jump in here too with some things, some, some things that I've learned. One is, um, besides you, who else is involved in making the decision? So besides you is implying that they are you know, very powerful in the decision-making process. Besides you, who else is involved in the decision? Um, and then the, the process of leveling with them, and I think I mentioned this in the last call, Can't putting yourself on the same side of the table as them and being on the same team to say, okay, hey, look, Nancy, if we're going to get this thing done, and I've done this a you know, hundred times, this is what I do every day, we're going to have to get the CFO on board, we're going to have to get your GC on board, we're going to have to get your CEO on board or whoever, your boss on board, whoever that is. So help me figure this out with you so that, you know, the help me help you kind of thing that we can figure out how we're going to get this all done. And typically speaking, these people like to get on calls. Now, this is where I ask the question, how does your boss like to get involved in these things, which goes back to their buying rhythm? Because if you say, hey, what's the last thing you bought? And they say, well, I bought a, a this for $50,000, great. Was your boss involved in that process? In other words, did your boss actually talk to that vendor? And if she said, oh yeah, yeah, the, my boss got involved a lot. She was on every call with them. Okay, great. That means that if, you're, if her boss is not willing to get on that call with you, your chances of closing that deal are significantly lower. So we have to understand that the buying behavior is very predictable and repeatable, that people have exhibited from the past, keep following that forward in the future. Do you have a comment? Yeah, there? Steve, so I think that's a really good point. So as salespeople, we are often the most experienced person to help your buyer navigate them through their own internal sales process. You guys are having hundreds of conversations in here with often the sim similar types of companies, similar contacts, and those buying processes often look similar. And so if you can be proactive or prescriptive, hey, in my experience, the CFO or CEO are typically the ones who ultimately approve an investment at this magnitude. Is that also the case in your company? Yep. And then how do we help our contact to communicate that to them, to move up the chain? Is it putting a proposal together? Is it going on site? Is it going to uh, a client site to help them sell this? Whatever that might be. 
hold your hand and walk them through the process. The word you said there, which is in the challenger customer a lot is prescriptive. So the salesperson's ability to see into the future of their buying process and help them navigate that's huge. And it, I'll tell you how it feels. Uh, you know, let's flip it around for a minute. How does it feel as a buyer? Well, if any of you have ever gone and gotten a haircut, imagine going and sitting down to get a haircut. And the minute the, that person has the first snip of the scissors, have you ever had someone that you could tell doesn't know what the hell they're doing? And how do you feel at that moment in time? Panicked. And I don't care if you're bald. They might cut your head. You are panicked at that moment in time when you know that this person has no clue what they're doing. And that's the same exact thing that happens if you're a buyer dealing with a salesperson that doesn't help, help you navigate any of these issues. So again, it seems counterintuitive. It seems like you're asking a lot of these things because it's your agenda, but it's not. It ultimately helps them and buyers do appreciate this. You want to have a word on timeline here because we skipped it? Yeah. So again, I think timing is really important in helping us get an understanding of what is the urgency associated with this initiative, this issue, solving this problem. Keep in mind, timing is fluid. The more advanced your sales opportunity becomes, the more precision you should have. So keep asking this question. We're referencing an answer that was given to us two or three weeks ago. That may well be obsolete. Uh, at this point in time. So one, one piece I'll mention here, I mentioned specific scripting. Here's a question that I absolutely love for determining that timeline. Are there any internal benchmarks or milestones you all are working toward to solve this problem by? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, everyone, you gotta stop and write that one down. That is a gem. And that's what this whole call camp is all about. It's the, it's the surface, the the genius ideas and best practices from the sales community. Repeat that one more time, Mike. I want to make sure we get that. Are there any internal benchmarks or milestones that you all are working toward to solve this problem by? And the reason I love this question is because it's multi-layered. It gets your contact thinking about internal process. So, man, who's going to be involved? Okay, uh, well, we do have a board meeting in March, and I know that we've got a pull-up in February where we're going to need to have some sort of solution in place so we can pull together our presentation. All of a sudden, we start walking back. So something that looks like it's really far down the line actually gives us a ton of urgency to help us close it in Q4 because we have a discrete path to getting to that future date. And, and I love this, too, because everyone at this time of year talks about urgency drivers. How do you get them to buy now? when you're closing, not closing the call, but closing the sale. And anytime you can have, you can identify an internal urgency driver, an internal milestone or benchmark date that the company, the buyer has to hit, that's gonna be a thousand times more powerful than the fact that it's your year end as a salesperson. You know, they don't care about your year end, your year end as a salesperson, but you better believe that if they have an event in their company that's looming, like a board meeting, or a certain day that they have to hit a certain number or report a certain statistic or whatever, that's gonna get them thinking, oh crap, we better get moving. We better get on our horse. Yeah, exactly. And, and Steve, I remember from you, only 3% of buyers are ready to buy and looking for a solution like yours. And so in only a very small percentage of cases, are there gonna be people who have that specific timeline they're working against? But this question is still really important because it gets them thinking about that internal process anyway. It gives you a sense for that ultimate urgency. And when, when I think about urgency drivers, in my mind, it's all about controlling the process and helping your buyer to control their own internal process. And when we say this, you cannot control a process you don't understand. Give me that one question again, because I think that's one of the, this is one of these questions that it's, if you ask it with different words, it's not as good. You literally have to ask it just like this. I'll say it one more time. Though. Yeah. So are there any internal benchmarks or milestones you all are working toward to solve this problem? by? I love it. That's so good. All right. So let's, let's, let's put it all together. All right. So next step. So I have a subtitle here, tee up, schedule call if appropriate. The reason I mentioned this here is because I hear so often from reps when I ask them, what's the goal of your uh, initial meeting? What's the goal of your call here? Oftentimes they'll tell me, well, it's to schedule another call. And that may well be the case if you have a really good opportunity, but if you have a really bad opportunity or one that should have been disqualified, scheduling a call is actually a huge waste of your time. It's a huge waste of time for other internal resources. And so the important part of this piece, the next step is to first recap all of the information that you heard and then suggest, be prescriptive about what you think the productive next step will be. 
From there, you can then get agreement from your contact and if appropriate, then schedule that next call mm -hmm. or that next step. Yep. And so what I think of at this stage is you say, hey, you said uh, that it would be important to include the marketing manager, the VP, and the CMO on our, our next call. Um, why don't we schedule that for next week? Oh, you know, schedules are hectic. We're moving through the end of our year closeout. It's going to be tough for us to do that. Let me get back to you. That's a death knell for me. I hate hearing that because I know that they're never going to get back to us. They're going to get busy. We're going to lose a handle on this. Mm -hmm. So instead, I now pivot and say, I tell you what, given that you're busy across the next couple of weeks here, why don't you and I pull up after the new year? We'll schedule something for January 4th. I can answer any questions about our meeting today or follow-up materials I pass along, and then we can schedule that group meeting. Sound good? And now all of a sudden, I have a firm handle on this opportunity and a clear next step that I can take. And I don't have to think about it until January 4th. So many people are, are, so many buyers are so nervous about bringing ideas for purchase, given how thin budgets are and given how, how high the bar is for value and ROI in order to buy something in a company these days. They're so nervous to bring ideas to other decision makers and other stakeholders. That's why the challenger customer talks about mobilizers as much as they do. But this is hard stuff for the buyer, and we, and we lose sight of that. And Brent Adamson and Matt Dixon, the authors of The Challenger Customer, they remind us of that, that it's not that the buyer is lying to you. It's that the buyer's job to do the internal sales job is actually a lot harder than your job of selling to them in the first place. Right. It's exactly. actually a lot harder, and, and we kind of lose sight of that. So let's have a little bit of empathy for our buyers, too. And buyers, by the way, if you say you're going to do something, for goodness sakes, please do it. So let's go. Uh, you want to go, oh. Sorry, I got one more one more thing here. We're talking about, tell us the story of this call because we're moving into call number four, yeah, so right? We're going to listen to a really good example of this framework being executed. This is our fourth call, converting a non-believer. So Guy is the person we're listening to, to here. He's another great salesperson I've worked with. And he was a non-believer when we first started talking about this framework in closing. I heard a lot of the same kind of defensiveness that we talked about uh, at the beginning of our presentation here. And we kept working together. We, he was consistent. He humored me. He asked these questions. He followed the framework. And then ultimately this happened. That's such a great story. So basically in the beginning, he was skeptical. He was like, I don't want to uh, go and, and do this process is what you're telling me. Am I, am I right about that, Mike? So basically he was saying, uh, you know, I don't think that this is a good framework. I think this is probably not buyer focused, buyer centric. And he was trying to duck using this five-step process, but then you won over his heart and mind over a period of time. How did you win him over to even try it? I asked him, I asked him to humor me. Please <laughs> try this framework. I promise you this will not happen. You're not going to get people mad at you. Your prospects are not going to get angry. Trust me. Try it and see what happens. Humor me. All right, so sales managers and sales leaders out there, if you're trying to get your people, there it is. That's just the magic tip of the day. Just say humor me and maybe everything will be better. I'm just There's no <laughs> part of this process. Um, bring them up to speed and almost have a brainstorming strategy session where we can dig a little bit deeper into those initiatives, give okay. you a good idea of how we can support it. But also from there, you know, we could obviously come out with a more detailed, specific proposal that aligns with your research needs. Okay. Um, I think that's a logical next step. Yeah. Um, cool. So, you know, I definitely appreciated uh, your time today, Andrea. And, you know, I think with, you know, there, there definitely seems to be alignment between, you know, our capabilities, our experience, and some of the market growth initiatives that you guys are pursuing for 2017, 2018. Um, would you agree? Yeah. Boom. Perfect. Perfect. The other thing I did here, Steve, he has a he has a one sheeter taped to the side of his cube with that framework, and he humors me by walking through. And you can hear uh, in this call, we're 32 minutes into it. He knows the call is going really well, but he knows he also has to ask the question, so he does. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I see a lot. Don't oversell. And, and again, what you can't see on your side that we can see on our side is he's 32 minutes into a 40 minute call. He has eight minutes of this process. So keeping five minutes to eight minutes is key. Let's keep going. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned maybe the sales director has a little bit better insight into some of the priority of these needs. Um, who else would be involved in evaluating?
evaluating a resource like Hanover, or, or typically what's that process look like? Um, really, it would be myself. Um, so, Steve, you hear that? Her wheels are turning. She hasn't really considered this before. Huh, let me, let me think about this. Who else would be involved? This is the first time that she's ever thought of, how do I sell this service through internal? Beautiful. You know, bringing a recommendation forward to our executive team of how to move forward um, to get more insight into what we want to get out of the market research, um, that upfront, I guess, brain dump that you were talking about so that you guys can put a custom proposal together. It would be yeah. just myself and uh, Jerry, who is our, he's our executive vice president of sales. Okay. Yeah, you can hear the hamster on the wheel in her brain thinking it through, and that's why you asked the question. And again, this is good. She appreciates this. Yep, she appreciates this because it takes the kind of euphoria. Every, every time there's a good alignment on a call, there's going to be this sort of euphoric rapport between the salesperson and the buyer. And then at the end of the call and after the call, the reality sets in the mind of the buyer that, wait a minute, as much as I, I think this is fantastic and we need this, how am I actually going to make it a reality? That's the tough part. So it sounds like you guys would be involved in the formulation of this and then it would go to the to the team for kind of thumbs up, thumbs down? Correct, yeah. Cool. And, you know, obviously there's a ton of different work here and it sounds like you guys are actively looking for a resource, a uh, kind of research partner to address some of these. Were there any internal milestones or deadlines related to you know, some of the market growth uh, work we discussed? I wish our sales guys were as good as you. <laughs> How great is that? <laughs> and that was the exact moment we had a non-believer convert. It's beautiful. Let's keep listening. That is so great. You've got all these questions down to qualify this lead, don't you? They, they teach us well over here. I've been, I've been here at Hanover four years. <laughs> well, you do a great job. Um, Thanks. We don't. Uh, yeah. We don't. It's a priority. The executive team has made it a priority, but um, I will be completely upfront when I say my budget for the year hasn't even been approved yet. So it's a matter yeah. of, you know, like what they feel like, how much confidence they have in it. Um, but I do know right now um, we are in a very strategic mind frame. So it's a good time to jump on this. Cool. Cool. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, timelines will be better defined as we better scope out the work as well. Yeah. Um, so that sounds good. Um, what I can do from here, uh, Andrea, is you know send you this deck that we reviewed to you know further digest Hanover. Um, I can also pass along, as I mentioned, you know we have heavy experience with aerospace. A lot of those industries we touched upon, a few okay. a few sample reports to give you a good sense of what an output would look like. Okay. Um, and then from there, you know I, I propose that kind of broader discussion with. Uh, Jerry, where I can invite a content director and we can dig a little bit deeper into these research. It's a real subtle thing. He, he, the offer, the offer for the next meeting is not just another meeting with me. It's bringing in a content director, a subject matter expert, a SME, a sales engineer, a technical lead, whatever, whatever that. But, but that's a really important note here is the offer for the next meeting is something that's perceived as being more valuable than simply another call with a salesperson. So that's, right. that's a key moment. And that also earns him the right to ask for Jerry, the EVP, to be in that, in that meeting. Right. And he's also prescribing what it is exactly he's going to do. I'm going to send you the deck. I'm going to send you a few examples here. Uh, based on what we talked about, I'm also going to coordinate this SME to come to this next call. And then he gets her agreement here. He has to give you a good understanding of how we would support it. And, you know, probably from there, um, I'd say, we, could, we would be able to generate a proposal. Um, that would be awesome. Be yeah, I like that that game plan. Um, and I'll prep Jerry once you send me the the slide deck. Um, I'll give him an overview. You know, so so when we sit down um, with you and your your partner, uh, he's not coming in cold. Yeah, so I, I love this year and again want to emphasize the importance of getting agreement on the next step being a productive one. 
because that prevents all of your, the majority of your calls falling off. It helps you avoid people who are being too polite and just scheduling calls because they know that's what you're trying to do. And it ultimately allows you to be more productive and focus on the right activity that's going to help you move this forward. Do you remember if they got that deal? They didn't. Get that. Ah, but that's okay. <laughs> they didn't get that one, but they got other ones like it. But the, the, the process is, is, it's hard to argue against it. It's great. So just remember, call, if you're closing a call, remember Satan. Don't forget about Satan when you're closing your calls, all right? Uh, we did a very fun cartoonish Satan here at Call Camp because obviously this is not what we're about. Um, but the, the, the S is the five. Five minutes alignment, timeline, approval, evaluation, and next steps. And uh, Mike's, Mike's questions are just absolutely dynamite. So um, how do you make this stick, Mike? Yeah, so again, I think this is a really – a really simple framework. It's really important because it impacts so many different areas for your rep and for you as a manager. And so uh, how do you get it to stick? Well, I think repetition and consistency are really important here. Uh, I'm going to walk through a quick kind of coaching framework that I found to work really well. Um, by the way, for anyone who hasn't listened to Keenan's call camp from October 24th on how to coach effectively, strongly recommend it. That was a really great call camp. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to practice. So without practice, this will not stick. Guy, whose call we just listened to, he had that outcome because he continued to practice, he continued to hold himself to following that framework, and that was ultimately the result he got. So for managers who are trying to coach this, here's what I would do. So write this down. Schedule 30 minutes with your rep once a week across a four to six week period. It's really important that you are consistent, that it's recurring, and that it's scheduled. Scheduled is really important here. Ask the rep for two representative examples ahead of your scheduled time together and ask them to highlight the close. This is an important piece because now you're not having to fumble around trying to understand where the close started. You can now focus on the last five minutes of that conversation and they've already highlighted it. As a manager, it only takes 15 minutes to listen to both of those closes and then it only takes 30 minutes to coach through those. So 15 minutes for each. And that consistency across a four to six week time period helps adoption in a big way. And once you have a believer like Guy, then you don't have to continue to coach it because now they've got it down like clockwork. So we're talking 30 minutes a week, basically. 15 minutes for each call and then 30 minutes with the rep? Is that about yeah, 40, yeah, 45 minutes each week as a manager. Yeah, but only 30 minutes for the rep. Yep, yep. It's 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 simple and you know you, you think you'd, people would do it more often. So. Um, take action. You know, if you found this to be helpful, um, this is where I get to be. Uh, I love plugging the guests because every every guest on call camp. By the way, if you have a nomination, a nominee for a guest on call camp, please let us know. We're looking for awesome guest coaches like Mike today. Mike is amazing. Um, I'll plug Mike's business for him because he's too modest to plug it for himself. He's working with clients now in sales process, strategy, coaching. Uh, he's building his own consulting business, hung a shingle up, and I'll tell you what, if I had him have all our reps here at Exec Vision uh, doing, doing the end of the call as well as he's uh, articulating today, I know we'd have more revenue. There's no doubt in my mind. So, so we might be talking as well. Um, so I, I strongly, strongly recommend get in touch with Mike. Uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to do an assessment for, for your organization, listen to a few of your calls, help understand where those gaps are in your sales process. Um, so really, really encourage you to get in touch with Mike. Any questions? Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Jesse, anything come in? Um, no, we have a few uh, comments on uh, bringing in other other people to call camp. Good. You guys actually go, a few of them have actually already been on call camp before. If you guys go to execvision.io uh, slash webinars, we have a list of all the other call camps, and we'll also try and get uh, some of these guests back for 2018. Yeah, thanks for nominating, gang. This is awesome. And, and what we might do at some point is do a, a survey for all the people who've attended call camps in 2017. So you can uh, tell us what you want more of, what you want less of, et cetera. Encourage you to go to that execvision.io slash webinars. And Jesse will send that as a follow up in the email so you can see all the call camps on demand all the time. So without further ado, get the hell out of here and go close some deals. All right. Happy new year, everyone. We'll catch you in 2018. We got a great, great lineup already started for 2018. Take care.